Hello, it's October 2016, and this is episode 61 of the Unseen Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Carr, and I have one panelist with me here tonight, uh, Adam Smith. Say hello, hey, Adam. Hey, Paul. Hello, Unseen <laughs> listeners. And uh, Adam and I have, uh, because this is uh, roughly the first anniversary of the release of the Boyaji and et al. preprint about the star KIC 8462852. We thought we'd just sort of mark that anniversary for this on this podcast tonight. Um, usually the Unseen podcast has more panelists and we talk about a wider range of things, but we're going to have a fairly focused episode tonight. We're going to go over the history of what happened in the last year or so with regard to this very strange star and, and also some of the favorite hypotheses we will summarize for you Jason Wright's et al's recent paper about the the strengths and weaknesses of the various hypotheses that are out there and we'll talk about alien megastructures of course we will uh, because every time we say alien megastructures we get more downloads <laughs> No, I'm not saying I'm not saying we'll it's alien because we can. I'm not saying it's alien megastructures, but it's alien well, megastructures. <laughs> okay. Um, now the uh, let let's start with what happened about a year ago. Um, the what a, a paper appeared on archive called uh, Planet Hunters Ten. Where's the flux? And, yeah. it, and uh, yeah. it was by a lot of different co-authors, but the lead author was Tabitha Boyajian, uh, who's known to her friends as Tabby. And uh, this paper detailed a very strange behavior of an otherwise very ordinary star. Now, the, now I should point out that the data, the primary data that looks weird was taken from 2009 through 2013. It took a couple of years to discover, A, that the data was strange, and B, to do the follow-up work to establish that the, that the behavior of the star was not something we yeah. would expect. Right? I mean, uh, it, 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 what, because the star... Credit, start, a lot yeah. of credit to... Um, Credit to Planet Hunters, Citizen Science Project. Yeah, it was it was those people that, that flagged this star as being unusual, and that led to the paper. That's right. Yeah, so, and uh, that's there's the uh, there's the power of citizen science right there. Right, and and, and they are uh, credited as co-authors on the paper. Um, yeah, absolutely. I can't remember all their names, but they're they're there. Uh, there will be links, of course, in the show notes to all this stuff. Um, I'll pro probably just link to the Simbad page because on the Simbad page there are links to all the the published papers for uh, for the star, uh, which this now this now been published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society as of I believe last June. Uh, but at the time it was just a preprint, and this is uh, something that's been an interesting trend the last few years. A lot of scientists putting their work out on archive or other uh, preprint services before it's been published in a, in a journal. The journal, of course, will charge you a stiff subscription fee to read their journal, but you can read the preprint for free online. And uh, so this preprint came out after, and it was a, it represented work by a lot of people. The planet hunters, and then a lot of astronomers who followed up, uh, because a lot of very good astronomers. Yeah, I must say, top-notch astronomers whose names I recognise. People like uh, Chris Lintop, who does uh, the Sky at Night. Right, and, Tabi Boyajian is a, a well-respected astronomer who's found a lot of exoplanets using Kepler. She's right. An now, expert in using yeah, we should we should point out Kepler. that that Planet Hunters 
are just like their name, right? They're looking for small dips in the in a star's light curve. And a light curve, I guess I should explain what that is. A light curve is a plot uh, versus time of the brightness of a star. And if a planet passes in yeah. fr front of a star, there will be a very small, short duration dip in the star. Now, there's an automated pipeline that detects a lot of these dips, but some of them are a little strange, a little unusual. And so they decided to use the human brain to supplement that using planet hunters. And planet hunters are actually very good at finding funny things in light curves. And they found quite a few exoplanets themselves. And these are volunteers who are not professional astronomers who just sit in front of their computers and look at the light curves from these stars from the Kepler data. And the Kepler is a space telescope that is specifically designed just to measure light curves of a, of a lot of stars uh, simultaneously. It doesn't just look at one star. Yeah. It looks at it's... thousands and thousands of stars all at the same time. And so there's well, a lot, there's um, tons of data for them to look at. It's optical photometry is what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very precise. Right. It is probably the best photograph photometric instrument we've ever launched in terms of the sheer number of stars you can see at one time, uh, factored in factored I mean, by the the, in the precision. Four years, it's four years. It, it it found. It's now found well over a thousand planets. Yeah, and several thousand candidate planets. Uh, yeah. And if, unfortunately, in 2013, it suffered a malfunction and can no longer look at the same part of the sky. Uh, it's, it is still functioning. They, they've got something called the K2 mission going, and it's still finding planets. But because of the malfunction, they can no longer focus on that part of the sky, which is around the constellation Cygnus. Now, let's talk about this particular star uh, which has become known as Tabby Star or Biogean Star or the WTF Star. Uh, <laughs> call it what you will. Uh, it's in the Kepler. It's the only... <laughs> it's, I was going to say, it's the only one of the uh, Kepler input catalog that I know the name of, know the number for. Yeah. Become, yeah. There, there, there are, yeah, there are hundreds of thousands of stars in the Kepler input catalog. Um the uh, so it's not surprising you don't know all the numbers <laughs> or even only one, but no, uh, but I it's also in the Tycho yeah, catalog, six, two, eight, five, two. yeah, yeah, and, and uh, but from now on, let's just call it Tabby Star or Boyajian Star. <laughs> uh, although she, I, she doesn't like that, she prefers the, it, the WTF star, uh, <laughs> hasn't it become official? Called well, the, uh, Simbad, Simbad put put it out. Uh, if you query Simbad, you get Boyaji and Star. But I don't think the yeah. IAU uh, has actually weighed in and called it that. There are very few stars that are actually named after people. Uh, I I like the WTF star name because <laughs> because it is what it is. WTF stands for. WTF. Uh, and that. Where's the flux? It's, a, it's yeah. an app name. <laughs> it is an app name. It's a very, it's the one very strange star in the, amongst the few hundred thousand that Kepler looked at. Yeah. Now we should point out that stars vary in brightness all the time, right? Lots and lots of stars vary in brightness. Some of them, even some stars that you're, there are stars in the Big Dipper that vary in brightness considerably. Uh, some do, some don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the North Star varies in brightness. Uh, quite a bit uh, at times. The uh, there are many stars that that the brightness of them vary can vary quite dramatically, and so it's not a big surprise that a star might see some brightness variations. Uh, even the the fairly large ones that that Tabby Star saw, but what was strange about this star was the way the brightness variations occurred and the fact that it's not, it's 
the follow-up work showed that it's a type of star that shouldn't have any brightness variation, so of any significant uh, short-term uh, amplitude. Yeah. It, it by it, it's a, it, it appears to be an ordinary F-type star, a main sequence star. Yeah, and by main, main, yeah, and by main sequence we mean it's still burning hydrogen, turning into helium, and so on. It's a, it's in a very stable state, and it should be like that for two or three billion years. Yeah, and, and pretty much like our, our own sun. Yeah, it, it's a middle-aged, ordinary star, but uh, F-type stars live faster and die younger. They do. Yeah, stars like the sun. The, you know, they don't. Uh, they typically only live for about three billion years. Yeah, something like that. To our, our sun will live for nine billion, ten billion, maybe. Right. Who knows? Yeah, it's it's brighter than the sun by about a factor of four. Um, brighter it, and and hotter. It's hotter. It's it's uh, more than a th- about more than a thousand degrees Kelvin hotter, and it's it's a it's also uh, uh, more massive by a, about a factor of fifty percent. So it's it's a it's a bigger star than the sun. It's a hotter star than the sun. It's a much brighter star than the sun, uh, and it won't live as long as the sun. But nevertheless, uh, from it, all the things that astronomers can can learn by looking at at a star through through their telescopes and taking spectra of the star, that is looking at the, how the light varies over a wide range, they can learn that this is a star that it looks just like a star that should not be varying in brightness. I mean, if our sun dipped by 20% in brightness for a few days, we would sure notice that. <laughs> Every, yeah. Everybody would, would, I mean, you, you wouldn't have to be an astronomer to notice it. Uh, and In England, I don't have a sun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well... It, it, we, we'd get we'd get colder. Uh, it, we'd notice it. Uh, the right. now, but what happened was with uh, Biogen star was after Kepler had been watching it put out a very very steady source of light for about eight hundred days, a bit more than two years. Yeah. It went through a dramatic dip in brightness, about fifteen percent. Um, and this yeah. this dip was very was a very clean sharp dip that lasted for a few days and then it returned right back to the same brightness it had before. And yeah, that you know that right there, just that single event makes no sense at all. Uh, no, <laughs> and, and but but that wasn't the end of the story. <laughs> no, uh, and then it went. It stayed at that. Now there were some wiggles and fluctuations, but it st- it stayed at that brightness for about another two years, about seven hundred yeah. days. Um, the exact numbers are all you know. We c- we can get those for you. There there there'll be links in the show notes. I'm I'm simplifying it with round numbers, but about about two years. Period- of- yeah, the periodic periodicity that you're talking about might be important. It could end up being very important. So well, it didn't look that periodic, though. I mean, the, the the next set of events were different, right? There were yeah. What happened around day fifteen hundred um, was was really weird. There were a, a series of very dramatic dips in the brightness of the star, and then there was a huge one down to twenty percent. Now, twenty percent may not seem like much, but there is no way that a planet can cause a dip much bigger than one or two percent just by passing in no. front of the star in fact th- this big a big star like this one percent is pretty much your limit yeah characteristics of a spherical object passing in front of a star yeah well the, star a star the, this uh, size which is don't, yeah um they don't, the dips don't bottom out in a way that's characteristic of something that you would expect to see a, a planet-sized object moving across the face of a star. It just doesn't look like anything like a, a planetary transit. Yeah, well, it's just so, way too deep 
from anything for one thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, and these we're obviously talking about something that must be massive, right? But well, that's I, one. That's one thing. The first thing they thought about, right? Well, okay. There's there's a dark companion to this star that's passing in front of it. And it's pretty big, but it's much much darker. Mm. And so when it passes in front of it, yeah, it. it but that was one of the first things they looked at. Is well, is there something else there? Uh, is is this a what they call an eclipsing binary star? Because you see that yeah. kind of you can see that kind of thing in eclipsing binaries. Uh, and the answer was that. Yeah. Well, there may be other stars orbiting around this thing, but they're very far away from it. They're not close enough to cause this kind of... Well, a kind there of is tip. at least one other star that, that's been identified that is close to... Um, well, actually, we, do, we, don't know that, we don't know that it's actually a companion. It could be just an align, a coincidental uh, alignment. No. Uh, so... Uh, yeah. and, there's no the odds and, on it being a, a chance alignment suggests that it probably isn't. It probably is. I, I would guess, and it is a guess, that it is a companion star, but there's no hard evidence. Yeah, those things are very but difficult I, to establish. Yeah, you, you have to you have to have evidence that they're moving together, and uh, you know that's yeah. We don't we are they're about the same distance apart, uh, distance away from the Earth, and uh, we don't have that those data. We could, in principle, get no, the, get those it, data, but but anyway, let's back back to the main point. There's nothing close. There's not, there's not a there's not a, a companion star that that's whipping around it every 700 days. Uh, so no. Uh, and if they looked at something called radial velocity, which is uh, something you can measure, which is how fast the star is moving towards or away from the Earth. And it didn't change much. Yeah. It changed hardly at all, which means that there's not a big massive body whipping around this thing. Uh, they did find um, they did find a suggestion of a what was it a 0.88 day periodicity in yeah. the uh, well both in the photometry and in the the radial velocity data. Uh, and uh, the original paper argued quite strongly that. That is due to the rotation period of the star. Yeah, uh, and that is re very reasonable. It's very reasonable. For, some for people have challenged that. Uh, challenged that, but I, I think it is probably true. Uh, yeah. Um, well, the, the, if it's not the rotation period of the star, then then what else could it be? Well, the, that there was no. also <laughs> a suggestion of um. A, there was something about a, a forty-eight. Point four day period as well, but the, to be honest, the radial velocity data I didn't think was great. All of the the, uh, the scientists, it's just one of those things. You yeah. need a spectrometer, and you you need fairly long cadence observations, observations over time, really. Right, which they haven't got. That, that's what this. Yeah, no, we'll we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that later, but. Um, yeah. In fact, wh why why uh, Dr. Boyajian had to turn to a Kickstarter to get more observations of the star. Uh, but anyway, the the uh, the the interesting thing was you had these complicated and very large dips in the brightness of the star, which nobody seen anything like that in the Kepler data before. This is a star that when they looked at it with spectrometers looks like it ought to never show any kind of significant variability of those, of those time scales at all. Um, and all the th theoretical models for stellar evolution, which are actually, you know, quite good. They match the data extremely well, uh, show that, you know, you should never get those kinds of pulsations in, uh, a, what they call a main sequence star. You do get stars that, that pulsate in brightness when they get old and they burned all their hydrogen and they're, they're now in this, these phases of, of expansion and contraction, uh, some of these stars blow up. Some of them just shed their mass and become white dwarfs, but they all go through an end of life period. This star is not at that phase of its life. It's, it's actually probably 
a relatively young star, uh, it's impossible to determine right now with the data we have exactly how old it is, but it's probably about a billion years old. So yeah, a lot of very very young stars have light curves that dip as well. Yes, and that's because they have these massive dust disks around them. That uh, and, and and you can actually f there there are no what they, what they call young stellar objects, which are usually quite red. Uh, th they're known to have these kinds of uh, very dramatic dips, but you can you can tell right away that that's what they are and. Th there's, there's an act area of active study and have been for a long time, so that that that's not a mystery. We we know about young stellar objects, and in fact, uh, as I'll talk about later, the Ga Gaia satellite frequently does see stars that dip quite dramatically in brightness. Uh, it is thought that most of them are, in fact, young stellar objects, which are, you know, very very young stars which are still forming and still have lots of dust and gas around them, and that dust and gas. Is moving rather strangely and chaotically, and sometimes passes in front of the star relative to Earth, and you get these, uh, you get these big variations in brightness. Uh, plus the fact that the star hasn't really fully formed yet, so its its brightness is varying anyway. So, but this is a star that is fully formed, should not have a big disk around it, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But uh, the star varied in brightness by so much that Jason Wright, who who's knows his colleague Tabby Bayajian, uh, they were talking about it, and he said, "Wow, these dips mean that the star could be an interesting SETI target. That is, you know, from his studies of what." transiting megastructures should look like. And he'd already written a paper on this with several colleagues. This was something that looked similar to what they were looking for. Now, I want to point out, Jason Wright never said that the dips were caused by alien megastructures. <laughs> what he said was, no. what he said was, oh, that's interesting. That could be a candidate. So what did, you, what did the mainstream media come out with? Alien megastructure. <laughs> and, and then Boyajian's paper said, well, the only thing we have left that's a natural explanation uh, is, is this massive swarm of comets, which would, mm. uh, could, could, and I'll explain why the comets in a moment, but uh, could maybe block the star's light by 20% in some, under some circumstances. And so then... The press came out saying, oh, it's not aliens, it's comets. And they kept swinging back and forth between the aliens and the comets. <laughs> and, and, you know, well, I'm going to have to tell you right now, we don't have any clear evidence that this is an alien megastructure that's causing these blockages. Uh, it not ruled out, but it's also, uh, there, are, there are problems with that idea. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So what happened after Boyajian's paper came out in, about a year ago uh, is that a lot of astronomers jumped on it. They said, this is interesting. This is really an unusual star. Let, let's look at it more closely. And some of them were able to get uh, time on telescopes to, to look at the star. One of the most interesting was the, the uh, what they call the warm spitzer uh, there, there's an infrared telescope out there called in orbit around the Earth right now called Spitzer, Spitzer Space Telescope. The Spitzer Telescope uh, can't do everything it used to do, but it still has a pretty good set of sensors on board. And the Spitzer looked at uh, what they call infrared, which is the longer wavelengths of light that the human eye can't see, to determine is there heat coming off this star that is in excess of what should be just for being an ordinary star. And they couldn't find any evidence of that. They found a very small, no. a very, well, they found a very small excess, but it was not statistically significant enough to consider that a detection. So, uh, they, they found a weak, a yeah. weak signal. that's around four and a half microns wavelength. Yeah. But no, 
clear evidence. Yeah. We'd expect any anything hot or it doesn't have to be that hot to glow in a planet a large planet we yeah. would expect to see if it was sufficiently uh well if it were if... just just oh a infrared glow is um a signature of going on yeah basically. well the, the 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 wavelength that is sort of magical because freeman dyson wrote about it in 1960s was a uh, around 10 microns, which they really couldn't see very well. Uh, but uh, still, the fact that they couldn't see any excess at where they, well, they couldn't see enough excess to really call it a hit uh, was constraining. That said, they're, okay, there's nothing really, really hot, you know, like earth hot. No. You know, like 300 degrees Kelvin. It's a long way away. Uh, around around that star, which means that, you know, nothing big. So, uh, there could be something small, but that you know you're not going to detect the planet Earth, for example. But you could detect, um, you could detect you know something like an alien megastructure, which, which would presumably be large enough to block 20 percent of the star. Uh, if it was that big, and it was absorbing the light of the star, it should you should be able to see it in infrared. Possibly. And, yeah. Possibly. Well, if it was converting the sun's. I mean, I Sooner, uh, sooner or later, all the light has, all the energy has to go out in waste heat, and you know. Yeah, but you you could argue that any advanced civilization capable of going to the trouble of building an alien mega structure would would build a a very efficient one. Well, even if it was efficient, it's still that energy has to go somewhere. It can't. It can't just. Yeah. It it can't. It can't. Uh, and just the loss of no, thermodynamics says it has to come out as waste heat at some point. Uh, um, no that's yeah, but don't you, don't you think that that might be that's waste heat that we we understand from our, our level of technology and our level of understanding of, of physics? If we had if we try and think about how a very advanced well. It, it, as soon as you evoke exotic a... physics that we don't know nothing about, you're basically in the realm of magic. I, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that there's well, we we don't know everything, do we? We don't. Oh no, but I'm just yeah. saying that science can only deal with things we know about, right? Uh, yeah. And, and we think we have a very good handle on thermodynamics. <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe we're maybe there's something yeah, ex exotic that that we don't know about. But the local conservation no, of energy I'm seems certainly that, to be a, a solid, solid law. Now, I don't, I don't think the Spitzer observations can absolutely rule out the alien megastructure. Theory. Well, it would That's have to be I'm a cold, it would have to be a colder megastructure than. I mean, when we say mega, we can't really talk about anything alien. Unless we're talking about physics, we understand. If it's physics we don't understand, then we're just you know we're out of the game. We we have nothing to say about it, right? No. So uh, that problem, the the problem with uh, a lack of infrared excess in relation to an, an alien megastructure, is to assume on our part we as we assume that it's built as uh, an energy catching device yeah well yeah yeah that 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 is an assumption yes yeah uh well, that that, that, it, be, that um, if it's if it's that big if it's that big then the only thing we can think of that it would be used for would be to either redirect the star's energy or to capture it yeah. and convert it into some to do some work I, with it i would argue that i would argue that we can't really make that assumption we don't know that it's not, for example, a, a religious monument, a work of art, or just something we don't understand. Because well, we okay. No Let's come back to that. Of, of that kind of thing. Some, let, let, some let, significance let, that we don't understand. Oh, well, its purpose, yeah. I can assure you we don't understand that. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, the-, the, best, the, best, the best kind of theory that I like about going down that line of thought is that uh, an alien civilization noticed that we were looking at them and said, hey, let's put on a show for these guys. Hey, hello. <laughs> well, I, I do want to point out that we think this star is roughly 1,400 light years away. So, yeah, that's uh, a long way. Yeah, so uh, they would only know uh, about Earth in about AD 616. <laughs> Uh, very true. And, uh, or maybe even before that. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and we are seeing, and, and actually, and that's right now when, when, when they did something 1400 years ago, they don't know about earth, uh, about BC 800. So, <laughs> uh, you know, th- they, they would know about, uh, the Egyptian pyramids, but they wouldn't know about uh, Marconi or no. That's a very good example of a, a megastructure. Yeah, I was I was thinking if if an alien looking back at the Earth, yeah, and they they were able to see the pyramids in Egypt, what would they think was their purpose? You know, in in relation to um, what you were saying earlier about megastructures. And, the, and their purpose. Right. An alien civilization looking at us might look at the pyramids and say, what's that all about? Well, I think we still ask that question ourselves, right? Don't, I, we don't com- fully understand the purpose of, of a lot of these ancient monuments. Uh, we we no. think we have a rough idea, but we don't, you know, we don't really. That's, that's why. I, we weren't there. We don't have a sense of it. That, <clears throat> you can't assume that. An alien megastructure, and I'm not. I'm not saying that that's what it is anyway. I don't actually think it is an alien megastructure. But if it were, I don't think. It, it, in some ways, it's a disappointing because what else? It's an alien megastructure. If if that's the conclusion we come to, I worry that that that's all we're going to be able to say about it. Just that, and, that and nothing else. Well, let's let, let's 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 uh, hold that thought for a little bit and move on to the next thing, which was that uh, around uh, December of 2015, I believe. Uh, you might want to check me on that. There, another paper came out where uh, they looked at the star through a sub millimeter and millimeter wave telescope. Uh, from Hawaii, uh, which now this this is actually kind of a, like some this is a telescope that is on the Harry between you know, a infrared telescope and a and a radio telescope. It, it actually looks like a radio telescope, um, and it's looking at extremely short wavelength radio waves, which or if you want to think of it as very long wavelength infrared waves, and they didn't see a whole lot. In, in their signal either. So they were able to constrain the, uh, the theories about how much dust is orbiting the star and possibly blocking the light of the star. Um, so uh, those theories, uh, which were never that strong anyway, because it's not a, a, it's not a young star, uh, are, are now highly constrained and don't seem to be able to explain the big dips. Um, and then, uh, in January of this year, 2016, uh, an astronomer at Louisiana State University named Bradley Schaefer announced that he had been back over some archival data, which are actually, these are photographic plates that are in the library at Harvard University. And these photographic plates go back to the 1890s. And he went back and looked at the star on the plates and it goes all the way up into about roughly uh, 1989, I believe. Uh, and there's there is a gap. Yeah. There, there's there's a gap uh, in the 1960s, which is called the Menzel Gap, um, because that's when funding was temporarily withdrawn for collecting these plates. But the uh, he announced that 
he had looked at the data from the plates, both the electronically gathered data and his own manually collected data, and that there was a detectable dimming in the star over about a century. Uh, the dimming was pretty yeah. significant. He, he had it around 18, 19%. And plus or minus, you know, the, the, uh, like any good scientist, he put plus. plus or minus bands on it. Uh, and so that roused quite a lot of interest. Uh, a number of people were critical of it. They said, well, you know, that's very noisy data. Maybe you can't be sure. There's all kinds of uh, variations. Uh, but the Harvard people are very, very proud of their the quality of their digitization of these these plates. And uh, so they they went back over it and compared the did the magnitudes from the plates to what they what's called uh, standard Landolt standard stars, and they found that uh, the variations are normally much smaller than what uh, Dr. Schaefer was seeing in the uh, in in for for Tabby Star. So he announced and eventually did publish a paper uh, in the Astrophysical Journal that showed a dimming. Uh, over a century. Now, this is still controversial. I want to point out, uh, of uh, among many other things, this is controversial. Okay, uh, there were papers published that looked at the same data and found no dimming, but there were there was a lot of discussion back and forth. Uh, and then uh, in uh, around May of the time frame. We were told that a, a young astronomer at Caltech was look, going back and looking at the Kepler data, but not the same data that Dr. Boyaji and his team looked at, but something called the full frame images, which are uh, were taken about once a month. Uh, of, it was just a complete capture of the entire field of view of the Kepler Space Telescope. And they would, because this is a, a lot of data, they could not take it all the time. They could only take it once a month or so. And they would take this massive image from 42 CCDs, well, actually 21 CCD modules, which is 42 CCDs because they're in pairs. Uh, so this is like, uh, think of it as 42 digital cameras, all pointing, looking through the same telescope. Uh, they would take this image once a month or so, uh, and download it to the ground. And what this young fellow and his colleague, uh, his name was uh, Ben Monte, uh, working with another fellow, um, and they looked at these data from Kepler, and they found that during the four years of the Kepler ob observations, there was significant dimming of the star. Uh, particular the last yeah. few hundred days of of the mission, they saw a pretty dramatic dimming. This was not; these were not dips. These were these. This was a a, a gradual but very significant dimming. Now, uh, this is actually less controversial than Schaefer's dimming because it's based on much less noisy data. Um, but it's not as much. It's about three percent. 4%, depending on which which of those segments you think is real. But uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to explain. Now, the reason that the Planet Hunters didn't see that was because the data the Planet Hunters work with has f already filtered out in it the longer period variations, the longer term variations are filtered out because they're only interested in planetary. They're trying to, look, trying to find planets. Planets only pass in front of a star for a few days at most. Uh, typically, you know, less than a day. And so uh, variations on the order of months, they're not interested in. So the very complex processing pipeline for Kepler took all that information out. Uh, but it was still on the full-frame images, and that's where uh, Ben Monte and his colleague were able to find it. And they published that. And that recently came out uh, but uh, it, officially published, but it, it, the preprint came out a bit earlier, 
And I interviewed Ben Monte and the Wild Signal, and he explained all that, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. So we have now three different things. We have this long, this controversial long-term dimming that Dr. Schaefer uh, at LSU saw. We had, and by the way, Tabby Boyajian is now at LSU. I don't know if that's entirely a co- coincidence, but uh, I don't have the I don't have any inside <laughs> information on that, so I'm going to not say anything about it. Uh, the I think, well, Brad Schaefer was one of the people who was impressed with her work and and sponsored her coming to LSU. But the the other thing was that uh, the uh, we we have the dips that were seen by the planet hunters, and we have this relatively medium period dimming that was seen by Monte. And we have all three things, none of which make any sense in the context of a main sequence F star. Okay. So no. uh, now, so, and, and the, during this whole time, the, 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 <laughs> you know, it, it was this terribly amusing thing where you had, Oh, well, it might, can't be the comet, so it must be the alien megastructures. And it, uh, the, 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 the mainstream media kept whipsawing back and forth. Uh, this is where people like myself, so we came in, we did a bit of a public service. I, I hope I didn't, we didn't reach as anywhere near as many people, but we said, okay, folks, we can't reach either conclusion yet. We have to, we need more information. And one of the people who did the best job of, getting to the public the notion that we needed more information was Tabby Boyajian herself. And last spring, she sponsored a Kickstarter to raise $100,000 to get telescope time to watch the star closely so that next time it dips, we can catch it. We can, we can catch it in the act. We can get big, important telescopes on it and figure out what's going on. That's really what we need to do. We don't have enough information for any particular hypothesis to be confirmed or disconfirmed. And Yeah, that, that's now, where we are at the moment. Right? Now, I asked Brad Schaefer, I said, why does she need to go to Kickstarter? And he explained to me, he said, the way time is allocated on the prestige instruments like the Keck telescope or the Hubble space telescope. You have to have a pretty high probability of getting a good observation of something (laughs) or you won't get that time. And right now, if we point the Keck telescope towards the star and say, let's wait for it to dim, you wouldn't, you know, they would say no. They would say we've got we have important no, ga- it, important it, galaxies to look at. Right? It would be an absolute waste of a, a fine instrument. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, that but the the that funding is fair enough. The funding I mean, wasn't there. Yeah. I was very pleased that to see Tabby Boyaji uh, start a Kickstarter. It's a novel approach. Yeah, it was. To do and, such a thing. It's a very it's a very bold move. Yeah, and also I think it got a lot of people. Give a lot of people a chance to feel like they were involved, uh, that they were, yeah. they were helping out, and what they were. Uh, so what that, that it, it, it's paid off in that she's got uh, telescope time uh, down at uh, Las Cumbres in Chile. Well, there's actually there's more than telescope. one telescope. Yeah, but it's all around the world. It's the uh, the Elcog. Is it El Elcog? Yeah. Uh, network telescope. The network. Los Cumbres, uh, yeah, the Los Cumbres, it's a network of telescopes. Uh, and they are keeping yeah. pretty much constant surveillance on the star. Um, yeah. Uh, and they're looking at it in uh, different filters. Right. As well, different colors, which might help us understand what we're looking at. If you look at the light curve in different wavelengths, it, it's good to, to see whether it looks the same. In different wavelengths, right? It does or doesn't. It can it can give you clues as to what is going on, right? And we don't have that so, from Kepler because Kepler pretty much looked at one band. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, 
the 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 star has has remained very calm. It has over this year. It's been now. We should we point out seen. that the first people to keep an eye on it were the uh, the amateur observers uh, who uh, for the AAVSO, the Variable Star Observers, and uh, it's called the American Associated Variable Star Observers. But actually, there's a lot of uh, non-Americans involved, uh, including quite a few UK observers, and yeah, they have uh, they look at the star every night. They have good weather. Uh, and they couldn't look at it when, uh, last winter, because there was a period of time when the star is too close to the sun for amateur telescopes to, to get a good look at it. But, uh, they're, they have done a fine job of, of monitoring it just about every night, uh, for the last year. Yeah. And I the, think, uh, Tabby Boyagi and, and her team are also using a, a telescope at Louisiana State. Now, to observe it just about every night when possible. Right. Now I'm I'm pretty confident that if it if and when it dips again, the the Earth's big telescopes will hopefully swing into action. Um will Oh yeah, I mean th- that that's that's easy because then they will know that they have something to observe. Right. Yeah. And and the the if if it really is a multi day dip as the previous ones have been, they'll have time to bring those to bring the big telescopes around to it, uh, and, and not just optical telescopes, but infrared telescopes, uh, even uh, radio telescopes, even the Hubble Space Telescope could look at it. And hopefully, uh, if if uh, we detect a dip in two or three years' time, maybe even the James Webb Space Telescope will. Swing over and look at it. James Webb has a, a much better, it's much more precise and more powerful than uh, Spitzer. Tabby Star is a long way away, and, and James Webb is more designed for looking at nearby solar system planets. Well, James Webb has uh, a very objects. good infrared capability. It'll be the, the best oh, yeah. infrared telescope we've ever had, actually. Uh, and because it's really it's really de- designed to look at very distant galaxies, which are so so red shifted yeah, uh, that they're not, infrared in the infrared. <laughs> and it's it's still not going to be able to see something like an Earth sized planet. No, but it will. Or, you know, but it could get spec. It away. could get spectra that would be by far the oh, low, yeah. lowest noise spectra we could possibly obtain in the infrared. Uh, yeah. Uh, of that star w- during the dipping. And if we, you know, that could give us a huge amount of information about what it is that's causing the dipping. Yeah. Uh, it could also take, in theory, it could help do radial velocity measurements, but it's clear that. Yeah. Well, I think the radial velocity, yeah, it, it, could, it could do, but... sure, it could do terrific radial velocity measurements because. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, but that's, you know, it's not really optimized for that, but uh, it could. No. It, the, the, the main thing is that it, it would, uh, it can see uh, well outside the visible spectrum, much longer wavelengths than what the human eye could see. Uh, and what's, it's not that easy to see infrared from even telescopes on Mount Achaia because of the Earth's atmosphere. So, uh we have uh, we have the potential to really get a lot of new clues that we don't have because when Kepler observed the dips, nobody knew it at the time, right? It's what it was just one of hundreds of thousands of stars in the field of view, and it, it just uh, it was just another. And Kepler only downloads this data every every month or so, so there's no ability to at, react in real time to what Kepler was seeing even back then. And, and uh, so we're, we were, but now with Las Cumbres and the AAVSO on the job, we will see the dip. The next, the next time there's a big dip, like a 15% dip, we'll see it. And we'll have a day yeah. or so to get everything on there. And that's going to be really exciting. I, I, if it happens again, and we don't know it's going to happen again, but if it does, uh, you know, it would be, uh, a chance to really, really narrow down the 
the possible hypotheses. And who knows? We may yeah. see a glowing infrared object uh, that can't possibly be a natural object. Uh, uh, the are we are we may we may just slap ourselves on the forehead and say, "Of course it was that." Why did why didn't we think of it? <laughs> let, let let's go over some of the things that uh, that have been put forth. Um, you know, we talked about a planet. A pl- it can't be a planet. Right, planets just aren't big enough to cause those kinds of dips, and not only that, but planet, no. a planet would not cause the slow dimming that Monte saw or the Schaefer saw. Uh, now, what Jason Wright has—I should point out—if uh, you really want the best summary of this, Jason Wright and his colleagues have sat down and laid out all the possible hypotheses, including alien megastructures, and have ranked them by plausibility and discuss the strengths and weaknesses of, of each hypothesis uh, in some detail in both the scientific paper and in Jason's blog, AstroWrite, which is written uh, a bit more accessibly than the scientific paper. So if you really want to know in depth what's the status of each hypothesis, I think he's got the state of the art there, and I'll provide a link to uh, the AstroWrite blog. And I really do hope to get Jason... Um, on the wow signal in the near future, because uh, not only has he done work on Tabby Star, he's done terrific work in other areas that are SETI related. So uh, it's something, a team called GHAT, which looks for uh, waste heat from, from possible uh, alien civilizations. So what, uh, what Jason has done uh here is laid it out and he's laid out. He surprised me. I have to admit, I was a little bit surprised. Uh, he did say it is plausible that the cause of the dips or the dimming is something between earth and the star. Uh, it's a very rare alignment, but it is a possible alignment, uh, between some kind of object like, a a globule or a natural object like a like a a dust cloud or something between earth and the oh, and the star block globule yeah block glo- a block globule is one of the ones that he came up with uh which those are known to exist there're these molecular clouds out in space that it can be quite opaque uh to starlight uh they're small uh we don't know that there's one there but it's not a completely crazy idea. So he laid all these ah. things, he laid all these things out. Uh, and, uh, I'm going to recommend you go visit his blog to really get the skinny on these various things. But, uh, it is, we haven't completely ruled out this idea, but to me, it's out. I struck me initially as extremely improbable because it had to be so perfectly aligned. Uh, but he said, well, you know, it can be big enough. It can be bigger uh, and maybe would cover the star for that period of time that Kepler was observing it. Uh, and we don't really have much data outside that period of time. We do have the Schaefer dimming. Uh, but you have to understand this star, uh, what's called Tabby Star, uh, is known to move about what they call about 15 milli arc seconds a year, which is not much. Right, it uh, 15 milli arc seconds. That means it takes it about uh, 70 years to move an arc second, which again, not very far in the sky. Uh, an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute, which is a 60th of a degree. So it's really, really small angle. Uh, so to move this very tiny angle, it takes it 70 years, to, which is roughly the same time that that. Bradley Schaefer was looking over. So, uh, you know, you could get something in arc second in size that would cause dimming, uh, and even could in some places be, be thick enough, dense enough to block out 15, 20% light of the star. Uh, is that the answer? Well, there's problems with that idea, but there are no problems with it that, are completely ruled out by the data we have. So uh, now the common idea that the press keeps liking, 
likes to throw at us, it's not that great an idea. The comet idea is less plausible because you need a lot of really big comets and you need them uh, flying in swarms, which they are not known to do. Uh, so in terms well, of the, the comets we know, it's not a, not a great hypothesis. You need big, big comets. I don't, I don't think we can say it's implausible. It's implausible to us. Uh, it's, it's not what we see in our solar system. That's not what we're used to. But that's not to say that, uh, you know, the, well, what we seem to be discovering are a lot of planets and planetary systems that are very, very different to our own solar system. All sorts of big planets, planets very close in planets, mm -hmm. far out, long period, giant planets. Uh, it, when I first read uh, the Flux paper, I, I thought comets was a contrived answer. I wasn't too impressed with the idea, but after maybe it is, it is possible. Yes, but, well, well, the attraction of the comet <laughs> idea is that you don't need a big infrared excess to have comets, right? It's just a lot of gas and dust coming off the comet as they get close to the star, and then it's gone, and then the comets fly out, and then you don't have, you wouldn't see the infrared excess. So, uh, it, because it all, it just get blown away. No. So, or it so, could be, it, it could be very dense, over dense areas of, um, like, we have an oort cloud, and a, a a Kuiper belt in the solar system made up of very small. It's hard for us to imagine how these might clump together and form swarms. Swarms, but yet understand fully what's going on around the star. You know, with Kepler didn't see any planets. It didn't see any planetary transits. But that's not to say that this system planets. And it's not to say that uh, the end dwarf star very close to it, mm -hmm. planetary system. Well, the, yeah. The, the, the crosses our line of sight right. to Tabby's star. Right. Well, but the, the, the good be, thing about comets is that if we catch this in the act, right, we will see the, the spectra in the spectra, we'll see. We'll see that those are those are cometary type behaviors. Yeah, and there's, there's also uh, the um, the interstellar yard hypothesis, where what we're seeing is is uh, like rogue planets or bodies that have been ejected from planetary systems in perhaps billions of years ago and are, are floating in free space and sight. Or very close to Tabby's star would, would be more reasonable. You know, we don't we don't see them crossing the line. We don't see them crossing across other nearby stars. So it indicates that something is going on very close. To yeah, star. well, we don't have Kepler data for stars right around that same star. Uh, no. So we no. don't. We it's possible that something that a small cloud. Uh, we just we you know is causing those same kinds of blockages, but we're just not seeing them uh, because those stars are too dim, so they're not they're not part of the Kepler. Yeah. The Kepler Kepler simply doesn't look at them, uh, or, or didn't look at them. Um, in fact, we don't even have distance measurements. I want to talk about the distance measurements now uh, to those very nearby stars. Uh, they could be much closer to Earth or much farther away. Uh, the brightest stars near Tabby star that, that do have distance measurements are quite a bit further away than Tabby star. Uh, they're right. about roughly twice as far away. Uh, we, there was a recent, now I should point out that until this year, there was no, there was no uh, assumption independent measurement 
of distance to Tabby Star. The, the distance that was published in the Boyajian paper was based upon the fact that we know what kind of star it is, and so we have an idea of how far away it should be based on its brightness, its apparent brightness, uh, and they made an estimate of how far away it was. They came up with something uh, around uh, 1,490 light years away. Uh, the, the first measurement came out just last month, and it more or less confirmed that. Uh, it was. It seemed to be a little closer, but given the errors, it could easily be the same. So, uh, and, and that's the Gaia. The Gaia, right now, the Gaia is a European satellite that uh, is doing the most precise measurement uh, of to more stars that have that, that's been done yet. And it made its first data release last month. Now that data release is not going to be the final say. It's just, uh, and it's not the most accurate. Uh, but they wanted to just get some data out there to help other astronomers. And what they found was that Tabby Star is maybe a little closer than the Boyajian paper said, but it's not, as far as we know, based on the errors, it's not dramatically closer. It could still be the same distance. Um if it is closer, that lends some credence to the dimming that both Schaefer and Monte saw, because that means, oh, it's closer, it's actually intrinsically brighter, but something's causing it to dim. But it's not, we don't have the, enough information yet. In about a year, we will have, should have another data release that will be better. Uh, now, since that paper came out, there have been two other papers that I know of, and there might possibly be others that have found, uh, that have tried to reduce the errors in the Gaia data release uh, by looking at some comparison stars. And that suggests that the stars are actually closer than the Gaia data says, which means that uh, it actually may be significantly closer to Earth, uh, which led some credence to the dimming uh, but again, this is not a done deal. This is very early days for that. So I would, I would uh -huh. stand by, uh, over the next year or two or three, we will know a lot more, uh, as the Gaia date is collected. Uh, what happens is Gaia scans the sky, slowly scans the sky all the time and collects data from a lot of different stars and, they do this very sophisticated comparison of the positions of the stars on the sky. And this allows them to determine by something called the parallax method, the distance to the star. Now, that means that over, on, on, over a period of years, the Earth moves around the sun, the apparent position of the star will change slightly. It will, it will go, it'll swing one way, then swing another, and then come back depending on where it is in the sky. Uh, and it, uh, by measuring exquisitely the apparent location of the, each star uh, and comparing them all, the Gaia team can come up with these very, very precise measurements of this. These are extremely tiny angles. These, I mean, we're talking about a measurement of an angle so small that if if you it's it's like a dime miles away it's really really small uh and you you cannot i mean it's it's hard for the human brain to think of angles that small but that's that's how great these distances are and yeah uh so but by the time guy is done if all goes well uh in about Three, three or four years, we should know the position of Tabby Star to about a percent. Yeah, three or four years is is about right. I think five. Is it about five years? They plan to within five years. They've said that we'll have the full right data. The full data, data release will will include all the dimmer stars and so forth. Uh, now, Tabby Star being a sort of a moderately bright star. Uh, 
will probably have a, a very good estimate uh, within two or three years. Uh, the yeah, they're going down to they're they're measuring the distances to more than a billion stars, uh, which is going to be a a great boon to astronomy because now we'll really be able to uh, to be able to determine this this will work its way up to the the distances to the galaxies and we'll be able to uh, determine things like uh, expansion of the universe and so forth and more accuracy. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it will give us the most accurate map of our, our part of the Milky Way. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hold on. I think I might have a question. Uh, Oh, no, I don't. Okay. Um, by the way, if you're listening live and you want to have a question or comment, uh, just tweet to at podcast on scene and uh, we will take your question or comment or snarky criticism or whatever it is that you have coming our way. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, nothing yet. All right. Now, uh, I wanted to address a couple of things that we did get on Reddit. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, this is from uh, our user named Jose Solarzano, if that's your real name. Uh, <clears throat> when astronomers and astrophysicists say something to the effect that aliens are very unlikely, is that based on a prior probability calculation or more of a career preservation expectation management prior to disappointing experiences and so forth? Ah, well, you'd have to, uh, Jose Solarzano, you'd have to ask them. Uh, but I think the prior probability of aliens is uh, unknown. Until we have some evidence that pushes it one way or the other, it remains uh all we know is that there's one technological civilization in the galaxy. There could be more. Uh, I think that you'll find that the emotional and mental biases of astronomers and others vary widely. And a lot of them would love to find an alien civilization. Uh, what might explain the different yet similar nature of the dips? Uh, <laughs> great question. I have no idea. Uh, the, the dips are different, yes, uh, and uh, we don't, and 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 that's a good reason to assume that they're not really not really seeing a periodic phenomenon, at least as far as we can tell yet. If Schaefer is right, can the alien hypothesis still be correct? Uh, nobody knows because uh, unless this would be a good time to talk about. Uh, well, we've talked about it a little bit already, but. Uh, the alien hypothesis, as far as it's a hypothesis, that is an informed hypothesis, assumes that something called a Dyson swarm. Now, this is based upon a paper, a very brief paper written by uh, Freeman Dyson uh, in the 1960s, um, in which he proposed that very advanced civilizations might try to tap all the energy from a, from a given star, maybe their home star, maybe a nearby star. And the star, uh, to tap this energy, they would build giant solar collectors all around the, uh, the star and, and pull in a large amount of its energy. Uh, but what if, the, if they did this and completed this swarm and built it, uh, and the purpose was to harvest energy and use it right there, then the answer would be we would see an infrared excess. We're not seeing that. So we don't think we're seeing a classic Dyson swarm. Are we seeing some other thing? Who knows? As, as Adam pointed out earlier, we may not know what its purpose is or how it would operate. So uh, <clears throat> uh, what do you think about 3D 3 dip transits that appear very symmetric? Day 695. 1205, 1540, and possibly day 360. Again, um, I don't 
Uh, I don't have an hypothesis about that. Uh, it's interesting. I find it really interesting. The asymmetry of some of the uh, the light dips is really interesting. I I think it it may well be significant. You know, you would expect we expect a, a planetary transit to be very symmetrical. It enters across the face of the star, travels across it, and then disappears. And this isn't what we see. It, it, it's odd in itself that these dips are asymmetric. They come on, it's almost as though something appears very abruptly and then slowly, well, well, over a day or sometimes a week, fades away. We would expect to see. Yeah. Now, I mean, it, um, it's interesting. It, if we find the three biggest transits repeat at some time in the future and they are virtually unchanged or bigger, would that be conclusive proof of an alien civilization? I would say no. I, I don't like the no. word. I don't like the word proof anyway. But uh, unless it's no, it suggests it suggests that something is orbiting in a, in an orbital period around the star. Yeah, uh, the fact Maybe. that the, the two dips are not the two big dips are not identical, I think lends some credence to the the interstellar cloud idea uh, that this this is some heterogeneous thing that's passing in front of the star. Uh, but uh, it does or or it might just be very 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 complex astrophysical phenomena? A, a large number of bodies. Uh, yes, passing yes. At, at the same time, in a way that we don't yet understand, right? Because as as you've rightly said, we, we need more data. Uh, considering how big these apparent swarms are, is it unlikely that they are beacons? Considering the effort and energy required to build and maintain them. Well, I don't uh, see why you would build a beacon that big. Yeah, I mean, a beacon... You, uh, you wouldn't need to build planet-sized beacons. Yeah, oh, these are bigger than planet. planets. Be they're bigger than planets, right? Uh, the problem yeah. with beacon, the beacon idea is the opportunity cost. Uh, if you really wanted a beacon, uh, just use a laser. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it would be a lot less energy and a lot less lot less effort. Uh, we could a lot probably less trouble. Uh, let's see, um, I'm curious to what how about how astronomers think about KIC. This is from uh, ruptured heart theory on Reddit. I'm curious about how astronomers think about KIC 8462852 in relation to other very different stars that also have variation in luminosity. Think about Myra variable stars anytime a semi-regular variable star. Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of different types of variable stars. Uh, those are all pretty well known to astronomers. The problem with none of those stars, those stars all vary in a way that uh, generally pretty well understood. And what you don't see is them being very flat at a baseline, then dipping, and then coming back up to that same baseline. Uh, that That's very unusual. Uh, in fact, unknown, I would say, except for the young stellar objects that we've talked about. Uh, yeah. Variable stars produce um, a very distinct light curve. We know what a variable star like curve looks like, and this isn't yeah. a variable star. Can the blocking be yeah, non? On... Yeah, this is from uh, Nam Duck Win. Uh, maybe his actual name or her actual name? I don't know. Uh, I'd like to submit the, the below questions. Can the blocking be non-transit in nature? Uh, yes. Well, I don't know what you mean by non-transit. But uh, I th I think they mean not orbiting the star, basically. Yeah, I think that's what they mean. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what Jason Wright has addressed. That yeah, I think pretty well on his uh, better than I can. Uh, yeah, uh, it, but but it just if, makes if, sense. if it. it you know, in my view, it's probably is something transiting the star, but uh, we don't know what it is. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think I think so too. It's more. It's got to be something huge. Uh, 
it, either it's covering the entire star with an opa- with a certain limited opacity, or uh, it's uh, which is one possibility. That is, it's it's uh, like a this giant cloud, uh, which the the comet swarm is is in that class of things. Um, can we comment on the recent Sonnenberg? Pl- this is a, a wild bug has appeared. Recent Sonnenberg plate results. Uh, I really don't feel qualified to comment on that myself. Uh, I mean, the a team led Comments by on what? a team led by Michael Hipke did uh, look at uh, some plates from a German observatory uh, that does cover the Menzel gap. That is a, the gap that Harvard does not have. Uh, they, in their analysis, they found no long-term dimming. Uh, is that the last word? No. Uh, the, uh, is, is it interesting? Yes. Uh, that's a probably pretty much all I can say. The, this kind of photometry is, has a lot of subtleties and takes a tremendous amount of expertise to really get right. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I, I'm but, gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer. But, I think that we need to let the experts argue this out. Uh, and uh, I was, I had, I have questions uh, f- about that paper. Uh, the the comparison, the method for comparison star struck me as odd. Uh, but I'm not an expert in photometry, so I'm going to defer that. Um, it's entirely possible that it's valid. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have more information for you. I, I, I think that uh, I noticed that the, they announced recently that it was on archive, uh, and uh, it does not appear to have been submitted to a journal. Uh, if they really want to be taken seriously, they're going to have to submit it to a journal uh, and get it peer reviewed. Um, I hope they do that. Uh, I imagine they will at some point. Uh, Perhaps it's not not a done deal yet. Uh, so I guess we're going to have to say stay tuned on that. Uh, if the Sonnenberg plate results turned out yeah. to be solid uh, and not, not uh, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, correct, then, yeah, they do kind of, they tend to, uh, they tend to work against Schaefer's claim of, the, of dimming over the long term. They do, but the most the the, the recent Kepler uh, data showing dimming over the four years of the Kepler mission, I would say is, is more stronger evidence than either uh, uh, of the two studies that looked at the long term dim uh, and uh, the other one by um, Angerhausen and. Yeah. Uh so uh they both said let them argue it out. Yeah, well I think and that uh what happens. Th- the problem is with these these archi- it, it's Yeah. These archival photographic plates uh uh that are 50, 60, 70, 100 years old uh it is uh you know there's a lot of subtle things that can go wrong there. I think bro- Brad Schaefer did a, a really good. It, it, it's a is to be applauded for his attempt to look at that data. Oh know? yeah, yeah. He did a lot of hard work there. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, the Dash people uh, at Harvard have been doing that work for for many many years now. Um, it, it's very valuable because it's our really our best source of long term variation in a lot. Yeah. I, I think the other the uh, the study that that said they didn't see any long term actually say they didn't see any dimming. They just said it wasn't statistically significant, and that's largely because of the the Menzel gap in the data. So that's not to say that there hasn't been any long term dimming. It's just that they they had more stricter confidence. In the you know, in there not being any dimming, right? Well, I think that that uh, 
like I said, that's still there's still some controversy there. Uh, I would like to see some professional statisticians weigh in uh, as well, because uh, things like data gaps uh, and can be uh, difficult. For, Reconstructed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Um, okay. Well, there's another paper that a lot of people pointed to, uh, which looks at the uh, systematics of the Kepler data. Um, and uh, it's actually not a bad paper. Uh, it it uh, tries to pre-whiten the data by principal component analysis and then di dives in and looks at some of the uh, very subtle uh, peculiarities. <laughs> it doesn't really... Uh, it doesn't really change much about the, the the mystery of the star. It just it provides some wrinkles and some interesting. Uh, fair, th there, there's been some discussion of some of the. There are some uh, stars nearby that are nearby in space that is nearby uh, angular space. We don't know for sure that those stars are are companions. Uh, it would take some pretty difficult measurements to determine that one way or the other. Uh, there are there are a number of stars. If you just go into Aladdin and look, you'll see quite a few uh, dim stars nearby. And some of those stars may have influenced the Kepler data, but they didn't influence it to the extent that they could have caused the dips or, or not caused the dips. But they may have caused some of the, the more subtle uh, artifacts in the data. Uh, so uh about guys that yeah i would love to see that paper yes. yeah navy yeah they they confirmed the dips basically they confirmed the dips that uh yeah Voyage and, uh, and her team found in the in the first paper so it's good confirmation that, that yeah Kepler uh, has found something real yeah, and, and uh, oh, I, I, you know, I don't think that's really ever been that controversial. I mean, uh, that's one of the first things they they the Planet Hunters went back to the Kepler team and said, "Are you sure? <laughs> Can this be real?" Yeah, and it, it, and they went and looked at the individual pixels, and it wasn't just one pixel; it was multiple pixels that had seen the exact same dips, uh, because actually. What you have to understand about the Kepler Space Telescope is it is optimized for photometry, uh, and they actually slightly defocus each star. I think was this the um, they looked at the same long cadence full frame data. Uh, they didn't look at the full frame. They they looked at the uh, but they looked at the at the long cadence uh, unprocessed data. They looked, uh, so right. Uh, I think I think what they did was valid. I just, uh, but whether the conclusions they reached are really within the range of what they uh, found is is something that's going to have to be argued among the experts. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the Kepler the the processing of Kepler data is very complex, and uh, Kepler does defocus. Uh, the telescopes very slightly so that the light from each star falls on multiple pixels. That's on purpose. That, that wasn't done. Uh, there's no other, I mean, there's no other space telescope that looks at this many stars simultaneously. There's some bright stars in the field of view. They wanted to make sure that they didn't saturate. And also they wanted to make sure that if they did see a dip, they saw it on more than one pixel. So uh, it, it wouldn't be attributed just to hot pixels or, some uh, other instrumental artifact. So this was on purpose. It worked well. Uh, as we mo noted earlier, Kepler has discovered a lot of planets. And it discovered those planets by finding very subtle dips in the brightness of stars. Um, and a lot of ground-based telescope follow-up has been done to confirm these. And uh, it does, you know, there is, there is a, uh, 
a very good validation of the Kepler data. Uh, and also, uh, during this main mission, Kepler turned every three months so that the the data we have is not from the same exact pixels, but it's actually from four different sets of pixels over the course of the mission. So we have uh, we have really good data that uh, and this in fact Ben Monte noted this in his paper that uh, he saw the dips on more than one set of pixels and uh, not dips but uh, the dimming that he saw um, and uh, this is uh, you know this is something that's that's that, that this turning was not. That wasn't done for astronomical reasons. That was just done to keep the keep the uh, focal plane cool, but it it, uh, it helped to validate the results. So, um, yeah, I mean that paper. I think is there, there's been a, 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 some other recent papers uh, which I think are still controversial and still need some more peer review, and might in fact have something to contribute. Uh, they're not, but I think uh, Adam and I agree that what we really need is more data and the Los Cumbres uh, observations and the AVSO observations are going to help us get that data. Uh, and uh, I would recommend uh, if you have a little extra time, go on the AAVSO website and look at the light curve. Uh, it's flat. <laughs> it's this. For the, it's been they've been looking at it for about a year now. It's very very flat uh, in all the colors they look at. Uh, the Las Cumbres state has only been going on for a few months, but it's also flat, and uh, so we haven't seen those dips yet. And uh, I go on the AVSO website almost every day. <laughs> and, we'll know. I'll I'll know when it starts dipping because Twitter will start going crazy. Yes. Uh, no. Yeah, and then they'll tell us, well, gosh, it must be the comets again or the alien megastructures. <sighs> well, that's why we yeah. have all it's, our... I all... think it's fascinating. It's great. Yeah. I, I love the... It's not these, It's not a eureka moment of, yes, that's what it is, but it, it's more of a, you know, what the, fu <laughs> what the fuck's that? Yeah, exactly. What's going on? Yes, uh, um, and and I and I'm in our interest. I'm in favor of uh, you know I, I I everyone likes to see the baffled boffins right, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, there's that um, there's a there's one hypothesis that we haven't mentioned yet that I really like, uh, and that's that um, these dips are due to a biological entity. In orbit around uh, Tavistar, that's growing. That would explain long term, and you know, um, oh. an object. I'm not saying it's an intelligent object, uh, an intelligent form of life. Even it could be a microbial, like a, something a, like algae, a space space algae. Yeah, <laughs> it lies dormant. Yeah, lies dormant in space. So it's like an algae bloom. And then as its orbit... <laughs> you can't rule out. I, don't, I, I think that's a great... Well, you know, uh, I, I agree. You, you, uh, it's on the table. That That is an interesting idea. I, I don't know how it works, but, uh, you know, if, if we... Freeman Dyson. Freeman Dyson came up with... Uh, he wrote a paper, actually, called The Kuiper Belt of Life back uh, in the early 2001 to something like that. And that he suggested something very similar, that the Kuiper belt and comets in particular might be very good places to look for life. Okay. Well, we have one more so question. Say, By the but... way, we have one more question, uh, uh, which is from Project Astrolabe on Twitter. Uh, if KIC 8462852 turns out to be much closer... Will that influence the possible range of plausible explanations? Uh, yes, it will. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's already, I think, 
it's already ruled out my favorite conjecture. So, uh, <laughs> which, uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but the fact that we, the KICA 462852 is not thought to be much further away than originally thought. If it's much closer that, uh, yes. Uh, and Jason Wright actually did have, a uh, have sort of, he said, said, uh, put some stakes in the ground in terms of if it's within 400 parsecs, it can't be this, or it can be that. Uh, and yeah, uh, it will influence that. Uh, we don't think it's likely to be when, when you say much closer, I mean, 10% is much closer, I think, but, uh, it's not going to be 50% closer. It's not going to be uh, something like that. It, it will be, no, I, uh, it, it, it might be 10 or 20%, 20% tops closer. I think uh, right now, the, I, the, would, I would, I would be surprised if the, I would be very surprised now if the distance figure changes us by more than 5%. Very surprised. Yeah. I think it's probably, you're right. You're I probably think it's right. going to be a, very much closer. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the original, the guy did release one, uh, the errors were probably conservative. Uh, it is, it does appear to be closer, but, uh, that, which is consistent with some dimming. Um, but it it's doesn't certainly rule. over a thousand light years. Oh yes. I think that's, that's clear. Yes. It's, 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 it's well over a thousand light years away. Um, uh, Probably, um, probably over twelve hundred light years away. And, I would say more like one thousand four hundred. Yeah. Well, it could easily be that. Yeah. Um, and uh, but it's not. It's also not much further away. It's not like sixteen hundred light years away or two thousand light years away. No. Uh, no. That's an awful lot of space, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's an awful. It's an awful lot of state, space for anything to to wander through our field of view. My little conjecture was that what we were seeing was a uh, was a console, was a stellar concentrator would require it to be further away considerably than the original estimate, and it doesn't appear to be further away. So it's not that. Uh, at least if it is, it's not that. Uh, that's not why we're seeing the dips. So. Uh, the um, you know it, it's it's uh, probably uh, you know it but it doesn't it actually makes the uh, the interstellar medium conjecture uh, no less plausible if if not more plausible so uh, we'll see we'll see uh, good question um, yeah. And again, I'd refer you to the Astrowright blog uh, to get a really good, clear uh, explanation of all that. Well, Adam, we've been talking about this for a long time. We could probably go on for two more hours, but uh, uh, I think... <laughs> and we shall carry on talking about it for a long time in the future, I hope. It's interesting. Oh, yeah. I, I think... Uh, we'll come back and... I think we're probably at least two or three years away from from uh, a consensus on what it is, uh, if not further. Uh, yeah, sure. Science is, science works slowly. Yes. You know, it's well, the it, way took, it, is. it took a long time. It took what, 20 or 30 years to get even close to a consensus on what gamma ray bursts were. Uh, and we're still not quite there. Uh, so, uh, it, they were first detected in the 1960s and it, it wasn't until we got really good instrumentation on them uh, that we started to get to, to rule out a lot of hypotheses. So it took, what, 30, yeah. 30 years or more. Uh, so we're, we, we're, need the next, we yeah. need the next generation of uh, space telescopes and the next generation of big ground-based telescopes. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't even get to talk about the SETI work that's been done. Uh, uh, the results have been negative, of course, but, uh, you know, the that's no one should be surprised by that. But uh, even people who think it is an alien megastructure, but uh, 
we, you know, we can talk about that some other time. Uh, we're, we're, we're due a SETI episode sometime in the next 10 or so. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, thanks a lot, Adam, for showing up. I don't think we're going to do recommendations this week. It's just you and me, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll resume those uh, on episode 62, which will be our Halloween episode, which is coming up. And th- there we're, uh, I think we've decided Thank we're talking. We're going to talk about something spooky and scary, and we're kind of zeroed in on alien abductions, which I <laughs> and we ha- we have a we have a special guest. His name is Jack Brewer, and he's written a very skeptical book about alien abductions called. Oh, uh, is he not an abductee? He is not. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't find one. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Uh, I have spoken to people, by the way, who. Uh, well, I I won't. Spoil, I won't give any spoilers, but uh, no, Jack, Jack has written a book called The Grays Have Been Framed, and uh, it goes into the rather sordid history of alien abductions, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, and also, maybe Sounds there is... Like fun. But since it's Halloween, we, wanna, we, want, we don't want to leave you thinking it's that you couldn't be abducted by little people coming into your bedroom at night, so you could be, okay? <laughs> <laughs> They're coming to take you away uh, any mo- any day now. All right. So, uh, yeah, tomorrow because Halloween's coming up after all. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so I hope you tune in for that. That's two weeks from, from now. Uh, we'll put it, we'll put it out on Halloween day, I think, or maybe just the day before so that, uh, you have something spooky and scary to listen to. Uh, it'll be fun. Uh, as usual, we'll kind of have some fun with the topic but we'll uh, because the year before that we talked about cryptids and Bigfoot and so forth um, it'll be some of the same people and we may even have someone on advocating the notion that abductions aren't all bunkum so uh, stay tuned uh, and then the next one after that will be November 11th that is completely uh, that topic is wide open the inv- invites went out today so, uh, although it's too late to get on the invite list, uh, if you want to become a panelist on the Unseen Podcast, you can. And in fact, we've added a new f- a new thing called the Unseen Pub, which we're going to try for a while. Uh, the Unseen Pub is a completely open discussion with no agenda, whatever, and uh, you can join that as well. So. Uh, Come over to our Google Plus participants community. There's a link in the show notes. And join up and you will get invitations to join uh, both the Unseen Podcast panel and the pub. Uh, the pub is a first come, first served. Whoever shows up first gets to gets a chat with whoever else is there. And it should be fun. Uh, we're not going to uh, take that very seriously, but it, it, it's a good place to just sort of shoot the breeze about some of these topics that we're interested in. Uh, so uh, we hope to see you in a couple weeks near Halloween and uh, thank you again Adam Smith yeah say goodbye Adam <laughs> it's cool. and uh, again check our show notes at unseenpodcast.com for more information also Wow Signal Podcast uh, and wowsignalpodcast.com has covered Tabby Star extensively over the last year so hopefully you'll go over there and check out some of the work we have there, including an interview with Dr. Abayaji and herself, interviews with Brad Schaefer, Ben Monte, uh, and others. Uh, Stella Kafka, who's uh, director of the AAVSO and others. So uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Good night. <laughs>